Hi everybody, this is Vincent with a quick guest tutorial regarding controller inputs and best practices thereof. I'm going to teach you some tricks regarding the Xbox gamepad object and some tips that should save you a lot of trouble in the future when you're looking to add some more control options to your game. So what we're looking to do here as a general overview is to use global variables to track user inputs instead of hard coding references to our input devices. And then we can use our input devices, be they controllers, keyboards, joysticks, mice, your touch screen, a DDR pad, or a set of rock band drums or whatever to change those variables. So first thing we want to do for purposes of this tutorial, we're going to be using the uh, Xbox gamepad object because it's probably the most, uh, the most commonly used type of gamepad that you're going to see. And we're also going to have keyboard support because obviously everybody's got a keyboard. So the first thing we need to do is go ahead and insert an object. We're going to add that Xbox gamepad object. If you don't have this, uh, you'll have to go install it. The installer, if I remember right, is up here in view, the extension manager. You can search for it. I've already got it in the box here. So you would just grab this and click install and you'd have it and then you'd be able to add it to your frame. So here it is in all its tiny, tiny glory. So this is our gamepad object, which is actually gonna be handling the behind the scenes work. And this is just a picture I've got to serve as an indicator. You'll see what that'll do here in a second. And here, here's our player, uh, as you can tell obviously by my incredibly high production value art. So let's go ahead and uh, set up our variables. So the next step is going to be to go over into our game properties and it's here under values, the little AZ icon. You want to go to global values and hit new to create a new one. And this first one, you can rename them by double clicking on them. This first one we're going to name um, input left. So this is going to be if the player is pushing something to go left and then we'll need another one for input right. So this likewise if the player is going right and what we're going to be looking for here are values from one to two or rather zero one and two that may seem counterintuitive but it'll make sense as soon as we get into it you'll see what's going on so let's hop into our event editor and let's set up some events first thing we're going to do is we're going to check whether or not the gamepad object is actually present and by that i mean whether or not a gamepad's connected so We'll do a new condition, check our gamepad. And there should be a, yes, gamepad is connected right here. Okay, I felt the need to point this out. I didn't have this in the example before we started because I wanted you to see this part. When it asks you for a player number here, it's asking you from zero to three, meaning that player one would be listed in this window as player zero. Player two would be player one, player three would be player two, and player four would be player three. So make sure you're taking that into account. Anytime you're using this function to check if a gamepad is connected, you're gonna have to go one player number beneath what you'd expect it. It's inconsistent with itself. The gamepad object doesn't do this anywhere else. So go ahead and do that. Player, gamepad of player zero is connected. So what we're doing here is just a quick check to make sure that our gamepad is actually registering. Um, and I'm actually going to use that to change whether or not our little controller indicator graphic is present. So let's go ahead and load up that frame and I'll start, this one is the right one. So I'll start with my gamepad disconnected. You may have heard windows. Let me know that I made a mistake there. So, okay, so you don't see this and now we'll go ahead and plug it in. there it's recognized the gamepad is connected so I just wanted to show you that event you can use it as a general trigger to know whether or not the players actually got a gamepad connected um, it's an easy way to know whether or not you should be funneling controls through the keyboard otherwise or just ignoring any events that have to do with the gamepad you can just uh, set a check there to see if the gamepad's connected and if it's not connected don't fire those events all right, so let's close this and get back to what we're actually doing, the meat and potatoes of this. So the first thing we're gonna wanna do is set up probably uh, two different 
groups. So one group is going to be keyboard, and the other group is going to be Xbox. Xbox controller. Okay, so keyboard, Xbox controller. And what we're looking to do here is to increment our values with keyboard inputs. So upon, uh, we're going to use repeat while key is pressed. This is important. Not upon pressing a key. Repeat while key is pressed. So repeat while key is pressed. We're looking for left. So hit the left key. And then we also want to check a variable. R big variable that we're going to be using. So compared to a global value, we want to make sure that input left is lower than two for this event to fire off because we don't ever want that value to get higher than two. And then we'll go ahead and change a global value, add two, input left. We're just going to add one, so we're incrementing it by one. So now when you go to press uh, the left key on the keyboard, it'll increase that variable by one and then by another. So let's go ahead and go back to the frame. We can use the debugger to see what's going on here. So we've got global values for input left and input right. And if I hold left, you see that goes up to two. It doesn't do anything when I release it right now because we haven't said anything. But it doesn't stay at one for any appreciable amount of time. It's only there for one loop through the events. So what we've done is we've basically added a uh, key down functionality, which the Xbox gamepad doesn't normally have. You'll be able to use this here too. And uh, so if you want an event to only fire off once when they hit the button, you can just check for that variable being the value of one instead of two, and you'll know it'll only fire off one time. So if you wanted a player to have to like mash the button to fire projectiles or something like that, you could have it check for that value of one. And you know they've got the button held in if you're getting back at two. So the other thing we need to do is that when this isn't, yeah, we need to do this, get rid of this real quick. So when the left arrow isn't pressed, so we want to do negation here. Let's delete this. We want it to set that value to zero. Input left to zero. Meanwhile, we also want to do the exact same thing except we're going to do it on the gamepad real quick. So D-pad left for player. Now remember, zero for the other window, one through four for this one. Player one, this is important, player one, D-pad left of player one is pressed. We're going to change a global value. We want to add to input left. So I am just going to copy this right out of here and plop it in there. Works just fine. Same story here, input left has to be the same so that less than two still needs to be there. So we're doing the same thing. We're just swapping out this input. And then same story here. Uh, we can copy this whole event line, do it again, and clean out everything but this so we can have this really quick and easy for a negation. Negate, so when the left button of player one isn't pressed, input left is gonna be set to zero. All right, so that's our basic stuff there. We've got the left button mapped out. Now the only thing we need to do is have it actually move the player. So we'll go check that event. So compare to a global value. If you want it to uh, only fire when the button's held in, you check for two. If you want it to only fire once as the button is pushed, you check for one. Uh, if you want it to fire off always immediately and not give them that one twentieth of a second delay or something, you can just do uh, greater than one. So whatever makes you happy. So when input left is greater than one, we're gonna cheat and just move the position by changing his coordinates rather than setting up anything fancy. Oh. We want the X coordinate. All right, so the X coordinate of our little dude will be 
the current x coordinate of our little dude minus one. So let's go back to our frame, run it. Now if I press left on the keyboard, nothing is happening. Okay, so I laid out the basics here, but I forgot one crucial step. And that's that there's a reason that we're checking if this is connected. So, if you don't want this to be all messed up, you can either set them up in groups and activate and deactivate the groups based on whether or not stuff is connected. Because the problem right here is that uh, unless I'm holding both of them down at once, these passive events are constantly setting the input to zero. And that's why it's not working correctly. So let's go ahead and take gamepad of player zero as a conditional and add that to our Xbox inputs and then add a negated version of that to our keyboard inputs. Go back to our frame and see what we have. Oh look, there he goes. Uh, so what's happening now is that the gamepad is plugged in and if I push left on the gamepad, he moves. If I push left on the keyboard, he doesn't go anywhere because the gamepad's plugged in, so the keyboard controls are disabled. If I disconnect the gamepad, and I didn't set that to turn invisible again when the gamepad's disconnected, but if I disconnect the gamepad, keyboard controls start working again. Meanwhile, if I reconnect the gamepad, they stop and you have to use the gamepad. So no big deal. If you want to do this, this is the basic gist of how it works. Um, you can either new use negations like this to determine whether or not a conflicting control scheme is plugged in if you want to set up events in these style, or you can set up events that shut down uh, these groups. It effectively, you can use events to do this and deactivate a section. But that's more or less how it works. We only did it for one button, but it works the same for all the other buttons. So there's the concept in a nutshell. Um, more uses for this, you could potentially set up uh, rebindable controls that also point to these particular variables. Any kind of input you can bring into the system, you can point at these variables. So the thing is, whenever you set up an event that triggers off of one of these variables, you know you're triggering off of whatever the active control scheme at the time is, instead of having a hard code uh, repeated events or or events to include all of the different possibilities. I hope this was useful for you. Uh, let me know in the comments below if you'd be interested in seeing more guest tutorials from me or if you have any other comments or questions, they go down there as well. Um, if you're interested in being more involved in the Fusion development community, I'd suggest you head over to Zentaco's Discord server. I expect he'll add a link to it in the video description. Uh, this has been your buddy Vincent. I am at VJ underscore Browning on Twitter, and you can also follow me at VJBrowning.com. One word, no underscore. If you're interested in finding out about the projects that I'm personally working on, have a great day.